Good evening. Welcome to the June meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. It's a historic event. It's our first night on television. And because of that, a few things will be different. One of them is if any of you want to say something to add to the meeting, you're going to need to go to the podium because you have to use the microphone. So that will make the, the meeting a little bit more formal. Um, on our agenda tonight, we have eight items under the superintendent's report, which is the information part of the evening, and there are 13 items on the regular agenda. So we're in for, I hope not too lengthy meeting, but we do have a full night ahead of us. We're going to start with the superintendent's report. And I'm going to ask for an end of the year report, a very short one from each of the principals. But before I do, I'd like to uh, very briefly report on the uh, administrative council report called our report card for the year. And uh, I'll make this very brief. It's a lengthy report that will be presented to the board uh, in July. Uh, number one, uh, in this year, we've developed the school improvement uh, plan that was sent to the state. And we're certainly in compliance. Joyce Parker chaired this committee. And we have just uh, sent an update to Augusta. The monitoring of the career ladder concept for teachers and the implementation of the program, uh, uh, what well, took a great deal of time, uh, as we all know, we had a moratorium uh, for further placement. However, we've rewritten most of the document and uh, the teachers have presently accepted those revisions and the board has now seen those revisions. One of the most difficult tasks was to determine the role of the administrators, and I want to compliment all of the principals for working on this. I think that was a very excellent job. I'm extremely pleased with the design and development of the K-12 computer literacy program. Uh, we probably will have, uh, in September, a coordinator. Uh, we have a five-year program. It'll concentrate from four through 12, and it's partially funded this year. The development of a language program and the committee I'll report on individually this evening. The gifted and talented committee worked at length. Uh, that will operate again under Mary Jo Thompson this year, as well as the new director who will be presented here tonight. I anticipate a full report early in the year. The development of a five-year plan for the utilization of the school district facilities is in order. The New England School Development Council will be here in July, and that $15,000 study will be started at that time. Hopefully, before the new year, we'll receive a report from that group. The expansion of the special education program has been reported to the board. We've surveyed 40 schools on the length of the school day and are uh, reserving that action until next year. Tonight, we'll review grouping and retention, a uh, program that we uh, have worked on throughout the year. And what I see for 87 and 88 at this point to be discussed by the board in the summer months is, number one, an analysis of the current standardized testing program, the continuing study of the foreign language program, to assess the impact of developmental placement, K-12, as well as leveling, that'll be, we'll devote, hopefully, an entire workshop to that this summer. To incorporate thinking skills in curricular areas with special focus on math and science, you'll note that we have, uh, we've been funded to the, some extent, and I'll present that later tonight. To address substance abuse, a K-12 curricular program, a design on AIDS awareness curriculum and to introduce outside evaluators formally in the career ladder program are a few of the goals and objectives that I would hope to work on this summer and present to the board prior to or in September. Now, all in all, it was a good year and we've rated ourselves approximately a B plus. Uh, I'd like to call on the administrators to give us a very short capsule of the year and what they see as problems or challenges for next year. Okay. Do you want to start with the elementary school? All right. All right. Our elementary principal is Betty Sharples. Thank you. This is the mic that you use. 
All right, this is not that brief because there is a lot that has happened at the um, Pond Cove Elementary School. Uh, one of our highest concerns throughout the year is that we have studied the space situation and as a staff we have made recommendations to the superintendent and to the board. As the school year ends, we have determined how space is to be used for the school year 1987-88, but <clears throat> you will be faced with the same problem again next year. Only this time to a greater degree because of high enrollment at the kindergarten and first grade levels. Next year's first grade class will be one of the largest classes to go through Pond Cove with 139 students. Seven classes already have 19 and 20 students in them. In addition, six kindergarten classes have 18 students enrolled at this time, and one pre-K pre class has 14 students. I share this concern with you because this problem is not going to go away. My recommendation is to have your space study done as quickly as possible and to have a recommendation ready early in the year to, uh, <coughs> in order that the staff does not have to deal with this concern on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the highlights this year was our open house. On October 1st and 2nd, we held open house of 462 students, 400 student, 404 students and their parents attended. The Pond Cove Parent Association sponsored events such as the book fair, school pictures, <coughs> t-shirt sales, the ice cream social, and the kite festival to raise funds for the second phase of the playground, which will be constructed this summer. In addition, the parent newsletter has done an outstanding job keeping parents informed of activities at Pond Cove. In the area of professional development, a number of staff members have completed the models of teaching and coaching courses. The entire staff attended in-service workshops on child abuse, handicap awareness, working with minority students, and creative and critical thinking skills. On March 20th, classroom and special service teachers attended the main event, an early childhood conference held in Wyndham. Throughout the year, individual teachers attended conferences on art, music, physical education, kindergarten, and developmental programs. And I'd like to update you on curriculum. In math, the Addison Wesley program is being used, but more and more teachers are attending summer workshops in order to be able to teach math using Math Their Way program. The SKIS Science program was piloted this year at each grade level. Teachers receive very positive feedback from students and parents as to its success. Next year, additional kits have been added and all teachers will be able to participate in the program. At the kindergarten level, the whole language approach is used in both reading and writing. In the upper grades, again, reading series is used. Excellent literature programs such as Holt and Random House are used to supplement the GIN series. A number of teachers wish to integrate the whole language approach with the basal reader, but plan to move into this slowly. This year, several special services teachers did develop a program for language LD children using the whole language approach. They felt it was very successful and comments from teachers, parents, and students were positive. Social studies is usually integrated into a variety of activities. This year, the curriculum for theme week was Colonial Times and the Constitution, and what a week it was. Headed by Mary Jo Tonson, teachers met and developed an outstanding program. Third graders went to the New Orleans where they saw wool preparation, spinning, dyeing, and they participated in a day of school in a one-room schoolhouse. Then the New Orleans group came to Pond Cove and younger students were visited by them in their classrooms. Children discussed and learned about the Constitution. Health problems of the times were also discussed. Field trips to see Sugaring Off were taken. The old Grey Goose artist in residence came and taught children the songs and the dance of the era. And last but not least, an old-fashioned baked bean supper was held with over a thousand people in attendance. In the area of integrated arts, <clears throat> which is headed by Mary Jo Thompson, and which brings artists into the school to work with all students in the areas of creative dramatics, storytelling, and art. Students perform for their parents and for each other. Third graders had their prints exhibited in the Thomas Memorial Library, and I am told that some of them now hang in the governor's office in Augusta. In addition, each classroom is involved in a series of lessons on poetry with Mary Jo Thompson. In the area of art, the Pond Cove Art Program developed by Marie Hayes highlighted the year with a pumpkin jamboree at Halloween. 
Exhibits of elementary art, printmaking print making done with the artist in residence, were displayed in our hallways. Sets were designed for a number of play productions, and Marie assisted the classroom teacher with classroom projects. <clears throat> in the area of music, under the direction of Judy Page, our music teacher, two kindergarten classes joined together to present Halloween songs and creative poetry and costumes. At Thanksgiving, two third grade classes presented a play to students and their parents. Holiday music and songs heightened the joyful spirit of students and faculty as they joined together in a December program. The 50th anniversary of Peter and the Wolf was celebrated in February by presenting our own version of a story featuring third graders and kindergartners. The newly purchased keyboard synthesizer was used for various instruments of the orchestra. For an end of the year performance, first, second, and third grades in groups of two classes presented music programs to their parents in the music room. Two other exciting events during the year were the Jumpathon and the Read Balloon program. program. All students participated in the Jump Rope for Heart event and bought in over $5,000 to the Heart Association. On a very rainy day, after weeks of reading books, over 400 balloons were let go into the air. Many of them went straight up and came straight down. Others headed out to sea. Dr. Pelletier saw one go by his window and commented that Sophie had found a new way of sending in messages. However, one did manage to make it as far away as strong. And our students took an active role this year by developing the playground rules for the new playground. Each class came up with their own set of rules, and then a representative from each class met with me to develop a list of 27 different rules. Each month, students having a birthday that month were invited to attend the principal's birthday party in the media center. A story was read, ice cream served, happy birthday sung, and a small trinket given to each child. <clears throat> and one of the highlights for me were Friday afternoons when I returned to teaching and enjoyed working with four students in an enrichment math program. These students were eventually responsible for de developing their own games and marketing them. Presentations were made to their classmates and orders received for each of their games. For us, all of us, it's been a busy and a challenging year. For me, it's been a year of professional growth, and I thank each of you for giving me this opportunity. I regret having to leave Maine, <clears throat> but feel it is the best decision for me at this time. I hope you understand my very best next year. Thank you, Betty. Um, on the note of your leaving, we on the board are very sorry that, that you have resigned, and I just want to personally comment that it's been wonderful having a, a principal willing to dress up as Mary Poppins and come to school and bring a real personal touch to the principalship, and I just want to thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Palmer is the, I guess the middle's next. principal of the middle school. Yeah. When Darrell called and asked that uh, we make a short presentation, I promised him that I would accommodate his request. I thought I'd give you some structure, and I just basically wanted to cover five areas, and that would be school climate, the uh, school planning that's taken place throughout the year, some of the staff development issues that we've been working on, also curriculum and instruction, and also to uh, just talk a little bit about communication, of which I know you are well aware, given uh, Joyce Parker's report but I still think it's important to highlight a little bit of that uh, as it pertains to the middle school. Some of the indices that we'd look at for the school climate would be the way the students interact with the faculty, the way the faculty interacts with one another, and generally the, the climate of sharing. And I can uh, attest to the quality of that which has occurred throughout the year. Um, we had nearly 75% of our students participate in the 7th and 8th grade interscholastic program, and I think that's a tribute to the coaches and also to that entire athletic program to get that type of numbers involved in, the, uh, in that program. We had students participate in the 5th and 6th grade in uh, the uh, math meet, which is held annually at Yarmouth, and our students did very well in that particular meet, bringing back individual and also school trophies. We had great participation in the Chewanke adventure, even though it was another year of rain and, and chilly air. Uh, again, we had nearly 95% participation among our sixth graders, and we also had 10 staff members, including myself, uh, attending. And I just, uh, I know that the staff looks forward to doing that again. And again, that's the uh, reaching out to the students to provide an experience that I think uh, has proven to be very meaningful for them and has proved to be meaningful for the faculty. 
Much of what we learn at Chewaukee, Chewaukee comes back to the, to the school in different types of ways, whether it be in the classroom or through our phys ed program. Our student council put on a breakfast, uh, actually it was a week ago Monday, and this is the second annual breakfast put on by the student council, and I tell you that uh, it's a real treat. I think it's a treat for the student council just to be given the go-ahead to do that. And on Friday morning, Mr. Jewett learned that we were going to be doing, having a uh, breakfast put on by the student council, and, and Monday morning they were there at 5.30 in the morning and, uh, and got a beautiful breakfast put on for the staff, and that was for the entire staff, including the custodial staff. The Parent Association did the same thing this year. It's the second <coughs> annual uh, sort of luncheon that was put on by the Parent Association. And it's their way of saying thank you to the teachers. And I can tell you that the teachers were most appreciative of that. I would say that the camaraderie at the uh, middle school ran some high points and low points. I think some of that was associated with career ladders and how that was, was uh, occurring. But for the most part, I think in retrospect, as I look back over the entire school year, that the uh, staff morale is very high at the middle school. And uh, their involvement in the staff development <coughs> programs, their involvement with students is, uh, is well known and it's something of which I am very proud. Uh, the kids are participating in many of the social and academic uh, programs that exist in the school. And uh, we find students knocking at our door early in the morning, staying very late in the afternoon. When I see students staying late in the afternoon and just conversing on a very casual basis with faculty, I know we're doing something right in terms of our relationships. Uh, mostly the older students, by the way. We see a lot of 7th and 8th grade students. And part of that is due to the lateness of the uh, start of some of the interscholastic programs. But some just like hanging around the middle school. And uh, at the end of the year, we do have an awards assembly. And it's one of the highlights for the teachers and I think also for the students. They look forward to receiving awards at the end of the year. And we had four awards assemblies on Monday, but we had our end of the year awards assembly for the 8th graders on Friday. And uh, that's one that I completely run. And uh, it's an annual activity and we highlight certain achievements of the students. So it's really an academic uh, awards activity that is presented to the students. And um, in that we also present awards to teachers for those teachers who have been able to be at school every single day throughout the year. And, and I just, um, I know and Bruce is sitting over there, we've got some teachers that really uh, do reach out and make sure that they're there every single day. And we had eight teachers in the middle school who had perfect attendance. And uh, we had nine other teachers who just missed it by one day. Again, I think that just points to the fact that they really try to be there working with the students. They tell me it's harder to plan for a substitute and deal with the aftermath, so they just as soon be there. The Apparent Association has uh, worked uh, with the school and bringing guest programs to the parents and also to the students. And I know that Martha Blood has done a lot of work in bringing people like James Garvin to our school in an evening presentation. And Pat Kerrigan worked to make sure that we had a program sponsored by day one, uh, Stephen Andrews, and it was an excellent program. They've also organized some social activities for the seventh and eighth graders and also for the younger students in grades four, five, and six. Um, the uh, parents are well involved in the school. I think we most teachers can call upon parents to help supervise some of the field trips, Marianne Casey's or Bruce's class trips down to uh, Two Lights when they do their science project. And any other field trips that occur, we find that parents are right there to help us. And I think that's a good sign. And we've had parents volunteer both in the classroom and certainly in the library this year. We had Loretta Pond work with the junior grades, grade book program in grades uh, Marianne's class and also in seventh and eighth grade classes. We had, I think, record numbers attending the open house program back in September. We also had large turnouts for parent conferences in November. And the seventh, or the seventh grade orientation, which uh, is, again, the second year we've had that. And we just had a really strong turnout among the parents. So parents are really becoming involved. And I know that the literature says and the research says that that is a key element to the uh, success that uh, students have in school and to the success that schools have. In school planning, we do have a middle school committee which works every single year. It meets a couple times to make sure that we're on track as far as middle school education is concerned. We turn over the research and just make sure that we are somewhat close to what we should be doing of national trends and local trends with um, middle school education. A year ago, a number of our staff went to uh, a number of middle schools in the state of Maine just to do a comparison to how we looked. And uh, we came out, we thought, quite favorably. Uh, this past year, we had teachers again attend the New England League of Middle Schools Conference in Hyannis, which is uh, 
a real eye-opener. It's also a very stimulating conference in that we can come back and share a lot of ideas and hopefully incorporate some of those in our school. We also had some teachers, some of our seventh grade teachers and eighth grade teachers who went down this past year and three of our seventh grade teachers did a presentation at that particular conference on the guided study program that we have uh, second year in Rona in the seventh and eighth grade program. Uh, we have had several of our faculty members participate in the school improvement plan so we're fairly much in touch with what is happening in the area of school planning and that's school improvement plan. And as far as one of the other indices in staff development, it's just how, how involved the staff is in making decisions in the school. And I think that uh, uh, we have regular team meetings and grade level meetings uh, where staff do a lot of sharing and uh, just do problem solving, make sure that the demeanor of our students is where we want them or it and to keep abreast of the curricular changes and ideas that are occurring in education. And also they do a lot of exchanging of teaching ideas. In staff development, uh, Mary has carried the, well, the bulk of the uh, responsibility this year in organizing the programs. And uh, thanks goes to Mary for organizing the models of teaching programs, level one and two, and also to the coaching program. And I know that a number of staff, K through 12, have participated, and certainly a, a number of our middle school teachers as well. Um, and that, I would say, has, and Harold asked this question a couple of board meetings ago about the, uh, the importance of the staff development program. And I think we have just cracked the nut when it comes to staff development, uh, um, allocating monies for staff development and making sure that we really push with staff development needs in schools. And it is my opinion, and from what I've seen happening in the classroom through career ladders and also through uh, support teams, that a tremendous amount of things are happening in the classroom. And I'm talking about teachers talking about what is going on in the classroom, their teaching effectiveness and bringing in new strategies to teach the content that they're responsible for teaching. So it has been, uh, actually a blessing for the school system in that we have turned to staff development as a real issue to deal with in Cape Elizabeth. And I think that goes back to the Bay Area Writing Program, which we know um, has, has uh, shown excellent results in both the main assessment uh, test for grades four and eight, and also uh, uh, just how we feel about what our students are doing in the area of writing. So the campus-based staff development programs have been a real key this year. And I'm very pleased with what's happened in the middle school as a result of our teachers' involvement. And I'm going on longer than five minutes. I'm sorry, sorry Daryl. Um, Fifteen members of our middle school will be involved in the Quest program this August, and I did want you to know that we've, uh, I met with Shirley Grover today, and that is a commitment from the school department for 15 of our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers to be involved in Quest. So there'll be a two and a half day workshop locally involving Scarborough, Gorham, and Lake Region teachers. So we've uh, booked up a full workshop of 36 teachers. And the, uh, and the, we have a staff development committee in the middle school which is responsible for program presentations on the half day workshops. In curriculum and instruction, uh, our reading program went to a basal, uh, clearly a basal that everyone was using several years ago and we have been working on that with Nancy Hutton's help along with Sue Welch's uh, to make sure that we're making a connection with the Pond Cove School and I think the reading program has, has really improved immeasurably since we infused the Basel program. We have added junior grade books in some of the classrooms. Teachers are beginning to take more junior grade books training programs. And we are also involved with uh, having a lot of literature-based paperback novels in the program. And through Mary Jo Thompson's integrated arts program, we've been able to bring in people, such as Betty's mentioned, with uh, Martin Steingesser and uh, Gretchen Berg. So the kids have really, and I tell you, um, they're just uh, lit a fire there when, when those people come into the classroom. Some of their work is outstanding. English series, and I do want you to know that in the area of English, we have, uh, we're responsible for making the completion of the English program in the middle school. This year we've selected Coronado for grades seven and eight, and I just briefly tell you that there was a great debate as to what we should be doing in the seventh and eighth grade. And I think you'll be delighted to know that of the three series that we boiled it down to, we selected one which we felt really raised the standard of instruction in the seventh and eighth grade program. It's going to be a, um, an exciting program to implement, but it's going to be one that has really set these standards much higher than we are familiar with in the past. And I, the reason we felt comfortable with doing that is because of the writing emphasis that's occurred in the lower grades. And according to our sixth grade teachers, our students are ready to tackle something a little bit more difficult than what they've had in the past in the English program. So I'm excited about what uh, promises to be 
uh, a very um, challenging year in the area of English in seventh and eighth grade. Barbara knows, and uh, many of us have been working on math, so that continues to be a concern to us, and we have an in-service, actually, residency, which will be occurring in November, uh, involving most of the staff grades four through, I think, 12. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Computer instruction was offered this past year, grades five through seven. We'll be adding the eighth grade to that this coming year. And in addition, I, I will say that we are working to include the fourth grade this coming year. I know we talked about that, and we will be able to offer instruction five through eight for sure, and we are trying to uh, poke holes in the schedule to see if we can squeeze in the fourth grade on some type of, of basis, but uh, no promises we're working on that. Um, in terms of communication, a lot has been said about the school improvement survey and what the middle school needs to be doing. Uh, you do know that Loretta Pond is taking over the presidency and with uh, Mrs. Boxer's help, I believe that we will have a monthly publication coming from the middle school which will address, I think, all of the, hopefully all of the concerns that uh, that parents have regarding communication and the fact that many times we send letters home with the students and they just don't make it or they get as far as the washing machine and after that it's uh, no good. So uh, communication is something we'll be working on and uh, we will probably forego the guidance newsletter as a result of that. But uh, those are the five areas and I thought that would help you give a little structure and I'm sorry for going over the five. Thank you Steve. I think You're welcome. A big challenge to condense the whole year into a few minutes. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, our third principal is Michael Efren from the high school. Okay. Well, I'm not going to be nearly as thorough, so I'll, I'll apologize for all the things I'm going to leave out, but I, I picked out a number of highlights. In looking at this year, one of the major issues that we dealt with this year was uh, the fact that we had 14 new faculty uh, in the school, uh, at, at the high school, approximately 30% of the entire faculty. Um, many of uh, these new faculty did exceptionally well. Of the 14, nine are going to be returning with us next year. Um, some of the programming that uh, that I'm going to highlight uh, for you because, because of its newness include uh, the following. This was the second year where we've uh, really been able to implement uh, on, on kind of uh, work very hard on our new writing process uh, curriculum. I feel very good with the progress that, that our writing program is making. This was our second year of a fairly new uh, ninth grade science program, which includes an introduction to science and an earth science course. Both those courses uh, are really still in development. Uh, science courses take a while to establish. You gotta collect labs, you gotta test out which labs work with ninth graders, which don't. Both those courses are still developing. This was the first year of our day one program at the high school and I'm uh, very pleased with how with how that program went. Uh, a lot of kids went through the assessment. The year ended with two groups uh, operating well through through the day one program. A group for students who were harmfully involved with substance abuse or, or use and a group of uh, for affected uh, students. This was the first year of our new uh, health program at the high school and I think it, uh, it uh, was a tremendous year for that health program. It went very well. This is the second year of our new ninth grade social studies uh, course. A uh, semester of civics and a semester of recent world history. Um, those are kind of large scale efforts to try to get ninth graders uh, involved uh, with social studies. Uh, I think it had, a, it had a good run this year. Um, we're in the process of compiling uh, evaluation data that we did on the program, so I hope to tell you more about that in the future. This is the second year that uh, we have published The Bartleby, uh, the high school's new literary magazine. And uh, if you haven't got a copy, you need to, you need to get yourself a copy. It's, I think it's another excellent edition. Uh, it, won, it won national awards in, in its first year, and I think it's going to do equally well this year. 
This has also been the first year of our new ninth grade structured physical education program, and I'm very pleased with how that went. It went, it went very well. Other programs that uh, uh, deserve special mention this year is our industrial technology department won both state and national recognition for the excellence of, uh, of the instruction, the quality of kids' work that that department produces. For the first time, we had our Spanish students participate in a uh, uh, nationalized, standardized testing program. And uh, at all levels, uh, we didn't test Spanish 1 kids, but Spanish 2, Spanish 3, Spanish 4, Spanish 5. Our kids uh, scored very, very high. They took a number of first places. Uh, we had anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of the kids in the top 10 in the state in, in, in Spanish. So we did, we did very well. And uh, the homestay programs that the Foreign Language Department ran this year, both, both on the Spanish side and the French side, both had very successful experiences. Both those programs have two parts. Uh, uh, one program takes uh, foreign students, mainly Hispanic students, and they live in Cape Elizabeth either for a semester or a year. A group of uh, eight Cape Elizabeth students visited Spain for three weeks. Then on the French side, we had a group of about, um, about 13 or 12 or 13 uh, Cape Elizabeth students go to France for three weeks, and then their counterparts came and stayed in Cape Elizabeth for three weeks. Those programs went, went beautifully this year. Um, building management issues. Uh, I think building management on the whole uh, uh, was was improved this year, but there's a couple of there were there are a couple of issues that deserve special mention because they were uh, fairly problematic. Whenever you you lose a, one of your regular classroom teachers in the middle of the year, especially in the second semester, you have a major disruption and it's very hard to cover it and it's very hard to keep consistency for those students. We had two such situations and both situations were tough to try to keep things going well for students. Um, the, subs the substitute situation this year represented major issues for building management. Parents Forum uh, uh, deserves special mention because we just had an incredibly uh, wonderful year with our, with our parents. They were very supportive. They ran uh, two faculty luncheons. They ran a couple of desserts. Uh, they sponsored four scholarships for graduating seniors. They uh, sponsored a number of teacher grants at the end of the year. And they are coming up with more and more creative ways of doing fundraising. They, they were into art auctions and now fashion shows. And it's been a lot of fun doing fundraising with them. They've had a, a wonderful year and I congratulate them for them, thank them for their success. Um, Another program that deserves special mention this year is the guidance department ran this year six career fairs. And the career fairs highlighted, each career fair highlights a different uh, career line. It included uh, business and finance, which was probably the best of the publicized of the career fairs. But it also included uh, careers with the military, uh, engineering, uh, sciences, in particular, um, uh, the biological sciences, and then there was another career fair on health-related professions. But the, but the fair that deserves special mention really is, is something we've been working at for about four years, and we finally pulled it off this year, and that is an interview fair. Uh, the juniors, through their English uh, classes, uh, all write resumes, they uh, prepare themselves with some interviewing skills. And in the past, we've been able to do some demonstration interviews. But this year, we got personnel people from colleges, from businesses, all around the area. And every junior at the end of that interviewing unit had their own individual interview. 
with forms, evaluation forms, filled out by the interviewer and, and given back to the teacher and, and each individual junior. We've been working to get the interview fair, fair to that point and it finally happened this year. We're going to write up a more thorough evaluation on exactly what went well and what didn't go well with that interviewing fair and I'm going to like to share more of that with you when that gets documented. Okay. More than anything, I'll really remember this year in terms of uh, uh, it's, it being the second year of career ladder and the impact on the building, the impact on uh, teachers and administrators in the second year of career ladder. Uh, it was particularly painful, it was problematic, and uh, a major focus both for faculty and administration. <clears throat> Student successes. I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the state championships. Um, uh, CAPE was state, champion, state champions this year in boys tennis, in lacrosse, in speech, and in uh, one-act plays. Our one-act uh, play troupe went and represented us at the New Englands. We were uh, Western Maine champions in boys soccer and Southwestern Maine champions in girls swimming. Girls tennis uh, was, was triple C champions. And our other teams that uh, had uh, very successful years and reached tournament play, uh, ice hockey, which was Western Maine runner-up, uh, field hockey, girls soccer, boys basketball, and baseball will we'll, uh, reach tournaments. We had five students this year who represented CAPE at the All State Music Festival. Let me give you some data on the graduating class. I don't think you've seen this data yet. We had a 106 uh, students graduate. Of those 106 students, 15 of them went to, uh, well, let me give you a breakdown this way. 76% of them went to four-year colleges, are planning to go to four-year colleges. I shouldn't say that in the past tense. Of that 76%, 58% or 61 are going to four-year colleges outside of Maine. 5% or five students are going to four-year colleges, private colleges in Maine. 15 are going to four-year colleges that are part of the University of Maine system. That's 14%. An additional 12% or 13 students are going to two-year schools. That's a total then of 88% uh, of the class that's going on to college, combining four-year schools and two-year schools. 88% is the highest percentage uh, that we've attained. In addition, we have uh, two graduating seniors who are going to a private academy for, uh, for an extra year of education. One student who's going to hairdressing school for an additional 3% who are continuing a, a different form of education, not, not college, leaving 8% of the students who are uh, planning to work. Uh, this year we don't have any students who are entering the military. We inducted 22 students into the National Honor Society, three seniors, 19 juniors, and we inducted 20 students into the Maroon Medal Society, six seniors and 14 juniors. Okay, so much for the year. <laughs> um, some of what we have on, uh, on the boards for next year is we are in the process, we have a, a steering committee that's been operating this spring uh, trying to map some direction for what will be a larger community team effort in Cape Elizabeth around substance abuse issues. Uh, I think substance abuse problems are alive and well in town and we hope to try to form a community team to begin uh, addressing some of those issues and I look forward to our second year with the day one program. 
Uh, next year, we'll have a, uh, a new athletic director, hasn't been appointed yet, but the new athletic director is immediately going to be faced with a major uh, restructuring of athletics in Cape Elizabeth because the Triple C is, uh, is joining with the York County League and we're going to be forming a new athletic league means new teams, new schools that we haven't uh, played as much, and it'll be major scheduling and major mechanics issues to work out next year, which is a new year for our AD and a new year for a lot of ADs in the Triple C. So it's a major change in, in the Triple C. I, for one, uh, think very highly of the Triple C. It's the oldest uh, uh, league in, in Maine. It's been very smooth functioning. And I think it'll take a while for us to run as smoothly with, with your county included. So why are they changing it? Uh, your county, especially B-level schools, have run out of teams to play. Well, I know, but I mean, the Triple C is the oldest one and it functions very well. We don't have to make long trips and we don't have to cart kids down to Kittery uh, on the main turnpike uh, some 50 miles. Uh, a lot of well, the how did they, I guess, Michael, Mike, and I don't want this is going to be a long meeting, and I don't want it to lay it, but how do these decisions get made? Why, why isn't the school board involved in this decision? It was the made. The directors go, and they make a decision that Cape kids will now be in a league no, no, this that was involves a, this was 50 a, miles from here. This was a vote of the principals of the Triple C, and the majority of the Triple C principals supported uh, the merger with York County. So but suppose the school boards don't. Suppose Definitely. the school boards don't want to spend the money to cock the kids all the way down there, think there's a safety problem, think that there's a problem. You send kids down to play basketball in, uh, in Kittery and uh, they get home at midnight on a school night. Suppose that they, suppose the school board didn't like that idea. I don't know. All right. <laughs> we could do it and see what happens. <laughs> um, I, I just uh, some things... I guess uh, this is not your problem, Michael, but it just leads me to observe, uh, and this is very, very personal on my part, I'm sure that it's not shared by too many others, that some of the things that we get to decide on this board, and I've been around here four years, don't mean too much what we get to, and some of the things that we don't get to decide are very, very important. Anyway, go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you, that one got me. No, don't, it's, it's, a, not calling for a it's a complicated issue, and it's going to mean different schedules for different teams, and its impact on different sports is different. Mm -hmm. Some sports are really helped, other sports are not helped. So I'd, I'd need to show you all that complexity. Uh, all right. Uh, building management. We're in the process of forming... Uh, with faculty and students and parent representation of uh, a policy review committee. Um, I think there's a number of policies uh, that we want to take a hard look at at the high school and uh, going to go about doing this in kind of a joint effort and, and I hope uh, to do to share at length some of the policy review with the board. Um, some of the areas in curriculum that are uh, especially uh, to be looked at and worked on next year. Uh, we're in the process of developing a high technology curriculum, especially a joint effort between industrial technology, math and science departments. Uh, work on that is underway. Uh, we, continue, we need to continue development of, of looking at and developing assessment programs at the high school. In particular, it would be interested to look at school-wide uh, assessment programs in relationship to grading and, and, and uh, students' grades. Uh, we're going to be reviewing leveling uh, and, and the policies around leveling at the high school. Uh, as, as mentioned in a system-wide goal, uh, math and science is going to be looked at uh, in terms of critical thinking skills, but also in terms of uh, different achievement levels for different groups of students. I just mentioned the data from the main assessment points out that the single biggest explanation for the difference in student achievement is student attitudes with regards to, well, math and science. 
students that see math and science integrated into their lives in some way score virtually perfect. Students who don't see math, or, math and science, now this is 11th grade testing last year, who didn't see uh, math and science connecting with them or, or, or integrated with their lives scored very low on, on that test. Uh, a second major variable that differentiated student achievement on those tests was sex. And of course, there's a real interplay there between sex and attitude. But you just have to assume it's there. That, that isn't given by the main data. Uh, next year, we will begin to try to follow through on the transitional program for uh, special education that got worked on this year. And next year is the year that we have to uh, uh, implement the state's new computer literacy requirement, which means we'll be screening and uh, seniors and, and arranging for courses for kids in the senior class who don't meet our computer literacy standard. I foresee, uh, despite all of these other things I outlined for next year, that really the major preoccupation uh, for administration, and I think for faculty also, next year again is going to be career ladder. Thank you, Michael. You got any air conditioning in this room? I don't think we do. Uh, there no screens? Yeah. Well, we all know there are no bugs in Cape Elizabeth. Well, maybe we should chance it. Nancy, do you want to just try to open or bend? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, and we'll just move on. It is warm. Well, they're doing that. I, I just want to thank you three principals. Um, we went over our time, but I don't think we often have a chance to pat ourselves on the back and let people know what's really going on. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, our, our next item is the report on the principalship at the elementary school. Bill? Madam Chairman, I suggest it's in order to accept the resignation of uh, the principal the elementary school, you have her letter, and I suggest it be done with regret. For the record? Yes, for the record, it's with very deep regret. I think we all appreciate Betty's fine work that she did this year, and we'll miss you very much. Thank you. Next year, I'm suggesting a pilot organizational program for the Pond Cove School. I've discussed uh, this plan with the teachers, and I think it was uh, received uh, with a certain amount of enthusiasm. I'd like to share it with the board this evening. Uh, those of you in the audience, if you look at the graphics that are not very artistic, but uh, the board has a, a better model in front of you, uh, I'm presenting uh, two models. Uh, and the model that uh, we would select, hopefully, if the board accepts this, would be dependent upon the people interviewed and selected. Now basically, if you look at the large square at the top, and I say this, <laughs> that would be the superintendent who would be acting as the supervising principal, with two lead teaching principals each half time, along with lead teachers from each grade level and from the special areas. This organizational plan is designed in line with the recent Carnegie report, calling for educational organizational reform. Now, it's designed to do the following. It will invest the Pond Cove teachers and give them a greater degree of trust and responsibility to render professional judgments about appropriate educational treatment. That group you see would represent a council. Number two, it's designed to capitalize on the knowledge, skills, and accumulated wisdom of our most able teachers. Three, it would reward leadership in which the entire staff would work toward common goals. It's designed to find ways of making the skill, wisdom, and knowledge of the school's best teachers 
available to the principals and other teachers. The part that I'm very enthusiastic about is four. Lead teachers would both provide direct supervision to new instructors, lead curriculum revision teams, and serve as consultants to other teachers. It would involve all the teachers in a collective effort to analyze the school performance and find ways of improving. Now, I've written for the board, and this is going to be a lengthy meeting, how I see some of the responsibilities that are broken down. And uh, they're presented at the back of the model. All in all, this can be done within our allotted budget. And it's my feeling that the design is worth piloting. And we'd be prepared to periodically give a report to the board. This is a quick breakdown, the third page of the report behind the model is a brief outline of the responsibilities of the various groups. Now this of course will have to be written up at length but uh, I think it's worth piloting and I'm very enthusiastic about trying it. Uh, I think it's in line with reform. If it were successful we would ask the new commissioner, Commissioner Byther, who is looking for model schools doing different things based on research to be monitored uh, by the department and hopefully helped fiscally. So all in all, in a nutshell, that's basically it. The only differences between the models would be the first model calls for two part-time principal teachers. The second model calls for one with two instructional assistants serving that other half time. Now that's quite possible because you know with the career ladder we have a, we have a full time substitute in the school. And that would enable us to be able to perform this in terms of scheduling. So all in all, I'd be more than happy to try to answer any questions. And more importantly, I'd like to launch the program and start interviewing. Uh, there have been approximately five or six people that have shown some interest in these positions already. Yeah, on your, uh, I don't know which view is the first page or the second, where you're square and then you're square, you're two teaching principles. Right. I'm surprised that you have been as many people below that level, it seems awfully top heavy. I didn't realize you were going to stay with your triangles and your, I thought you were going to your circles and not your triangles. Uh, let me explain that. <laughs> let me, let me try to explain that. I think if we were to go with the uh, two teaching principles, the instructional assistants would come down and fill one of these circles. So on that model, we wouldn't have triangles. Right. You should, let me explain one thing. Maybe these people for squares out here. <laughs> <laughs> we already have instructional assistants. You yeah. see, they're on the staff presently. Uh, if we didn't use them in the first model, the triangular model, we would change the specifications so that they would fall down here some such a way. I would suspect that, that at no time would the cabinet be any larger than three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven. Either way we do it. Are there other questions? Did you have questions? No, I just uh, remember the press out here absorbing triangles, squares, and circles, and he's going to write a very intelligent story about those tomorrow. Well, we'll be more than happy to furnish him with uh, the models of triangles and squares and also a, a verbal description. What, what is going to make you decide, Daryl, which way you're going to go? The, uh, after the interviewing of the people that are interested and their talent, I would come to the board and say it would appear that uh, the, uh, the 
people that uh, would uh, serve the model best, uh, or whichever model it would be, would be the following, with the following kinds of skills. Does one cost more than the other? No. It can be done uh, within the same budget. I think it, you're finding that we don't have too many questions because we've been talking about it a little bit informally and we feel like we know what's going on. Um, is there anyone here in the audience who'd like to comment on this plan of questions? When you come up to the podium, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes. My name is Kay Z. Will these candidates meet the minimum state requirements for principalship? No, not necessarily. They would not have to. Uh, the uh, teaching principals or lead teachers uh, do not have to meet any, uh, any particular or specific administrative requirements. The supervi supervising principal, of course, would have to meet those requirements, and that would be me. Or at another time, perhaps someone else. But that's the only uh, person that would have to meet those requirements. My concern here is not for uh, credentials that meet requirements. My concern is uh, candidates who are extremely well qualified and can do the various tasks that I think needs to be done. The, uh, the administrative uh, Qualifications and certifications, uh, I think, uh, we hold among administrators. And my concern as the supervising principal would be to uh, establish the policies for that school, to uh, make sure the curriculum development is going in the direction that I think the community should go into, uh, and to evaluate and supervise the entire process then uh, a host of other responsibilities would be done by lead teachers. Uh, more, probably most importantly, some of them would uh, handle the curriculum revision that I think needs to be done. Secondly, others would supervise younger teachers who I think need help. All in all, I think we could make it a, a lot stronger staff. I don't have any concern. I, first of all, let me say at the very outset, I think we have no choice. I certainly have been around uh, in and out of the elementary school to see one principal after the other come and very readily um, and unfortunately shortly depart. So I think we have no choice but to try something that gives us at least some hope for change. Um, I don't have a concern about the qualifications of any of the people, certainly the six listed across the bottom of this uh, form, or in fact the two levels above it, certainly not with yourself as the teaching principal. I don't have a concern with the qualifications or the expertise of any of those people, whoever they may turn out to be. I do have a very big concern, and I think it's one that is just a, a fact of this school and program that I, my concern relates to the lack of virtually any diversity in the point of view of the teaching staff as to how an elementary school program should be set up, what the qualifications basically for admission into a kindergarten program should be, what an appropriate curriculum is for a kindergarten, what an appropriate expectation level is for first, second, third grade in our elementary school. I really have a concern that there is very little diversity here, that, um, that there isn't much hope for meaningful change when everybody, almost everybody perhaps, thinks along one train of thought. I have a concern about that, and I hope as you work with this plan, which as I said, I think we have to uh, at least try, I certainly hope that you will keep that concern in mind that um, when people are in charge of formulating a program, administrating it, and in fact evaluating the effectiveness, it's pretty difficult for um, the same people to come up with evaluating what they have in fact created and implement as coming <coughs> up short. And, and I have a concern about that. I uh, can uh, appreciate your concern. Uh, but I have, uh, first, uh, 
I'd be very close to the program. And secondly, I have resources that I can use that uh, can help me uh, analyze the program and uh, project the kind of school it ought to be. And uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to have some help with evaluation next year. And I would suspect that some of those people would be experts, uh, you know, in early ed. And I would rely on some of those experts from time to time as well as the fact that uh, I was an elementary principal in what I think were two very excellent elementary schools in Greenwich, Connecticut. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wanted to ask a question or make a comment? Then, Daryl, what would you need from us now to go ahead with this plan? Usually uh, all I need is some kind of consensus uh, to allow me to uh, start interviewing next week, uh, coming back with the uh, candidates uh, and making recommendations, and then hopefully in a period of uh, three weeks at the latest to start laying the groundwork for a, a very excellent year. I'm happy to say that uh, Betty Scheibels has uh, volunteered to stay uh, for the whole month and probably uh, another week if it's necessary. So I would hope that we'd have the school in top dot shape and ready to go. Um, I assume you would welcome board members on the interviewing committee. Fine. So that anyone who wants to serve on that should let Daryl know. We would be uh, taking a hard look at those people next week. Next week. All right. Thank you. Late in the week. <clears throat> Superintendent's conference is the first two days of the week, so it'll be That's the last right. three days. <laughs> That's right. Do we have consensus on this? We don't need to vote on items in the superintendent's report. But we can either vote or indicate that we all agree. Well, I think it's important to, to vote. All right. to see in the minutes of the meeting that we're either for it or against it. All right. right. And is there a motion? To vote. Is there a second? I'll second it. Is there a discussion? All in favor? Forward and nothing. All right, Madam Chairman, the next report on space in the elementary. Uh, you heard from the principal. However, I want to indicate that uh, one of the reasons why I think it's timely is uh, I probably will be spending an awful lot of time in the elementary school next year regardless because we have some, some very dear space problems there and they smack of the problems we have this year. I don't generally share detailed memoranda, but you saw the one here that details where everybody's moving for about the hundredth time. Uh, our enrollments as of today, I think are in line with the policy. If we accept the policy, it'll be presented tonight for the second time. But any dramatic change would really cause us a great problem in terms of space. But the New England School Development Council will be here in July, and they will start their report or start doing their work. I suspect they're going to want to meet with the board. Uh, I don't know how many there will be, but the consultants, and I'd hope that maybe we could do that prior to a workshop or maybe even a prior to a board meeting in terms of uh, your feelings about the community facilities, space, history, a host of things. But uh, all in all, there, there are the changes. The staff has been informed of what has to be done. And the, the plans for handicap accessibility will be delivered tomorrow by Nancy to Augusta. So that school will be very busy because we'll have people working in that school all summer, both on the program and on the facility. So all in all, hopefully we'll have it all up to stuff for September. Are there questions on this report? Yeah, number three, I have a question about Pam moving into an office area where we were told the nurse couldn't be, and I don't understand why we can put somebody else in an area where the fire marshal said we couldn't have a nurse. That has been changed. That has been changed we, we have changed that. Priscilla, we have changed that. She, she's going to move into the classroom. 
and into the classroom where she works there will be a timeout room and a conference room built. So that will pull her out of the um, hallway. Is Sue Lucas moving back into a room where she's Yeah, she's been? moving into a third grade classroom over in the Lunt building. No, where she's already been? No. How much does it cost to do our reconstruction on this? I don't have the answer that, to that question. Um, Charlie, Charlie would have all of that. And I've talked to him. I know they pulled down the timeout room today in the first grade uh, classroom because that is going to be turned right into a full first grade program. So that has gone, and he's going to be building those rooms in the third grade classroom on the top of the Lunt building. Okay, I guess I had another problem with this same issue was that it seems like all over the Pond Cove building we're having timeout rooms rather than uh, Sue either seeing where she's been or moving back into a room where there's already a timeout. We've had such a tight budget this spring that I just can't see putting money into areas where they already exist in other rooms first grade. Well, that has been discussed, and I think it was felt that with teachers, there have been some teachers that have moved as many as six or seven years in a row, and it takes the time to, that they have put into a classroom and develop a classroom almost equivalent to the time that a custodian can put up a timeout room in a classroom. There's only one other classroom that that could be done in. We certainly uh, have asked the custodians uh, to do this the least possible cost. And the reason for that is that we may be doing this again next year on a larger scale, uh, particularly if enrollments increase. Are you finished? No, I had a question later on. Fran, go ahead. Um, uh, we will be having a new special education director, and I hope that before much construction or destruction is done that that person has some input as the necessity certainly multiple timeout or whatever else they want to be called areas and the necessity for some of the delineations that I see depicted here. Perhaps all of them are necessary and perhaps a new person might have a new point of view or a different point of view or be able to organize things in a different way. I certainly don't expect somebody to come in and make major changes in our special education program the first week they're on the job, but just as a matter of suggestion, we might be able to get some important input before too many changes are made. So that might be one thing that we could do to make sure that the plans, even for this next year, are going to be wise educationally, not just budgetarily, but educationally sound for the students that will be involved. Let me point out to the board that uh, one of the reasons why uh, the person selected from the superintendent's point of view was that uh, I was extremely impressed with the cost of the, one of the largest programs in the state that he conducted. Very recently, I had a long chat with him about the high cost of special education here in this community and indicated my personal concern. Also, uh, any appointments that are going to be made will be made by him. I'm saving those for him. He knows that. We discussed that yesterday. And I might add that he's extremely cost conscious. And more importantly, he's a, analyzed and examined our costs. And he has talked with and is going to meet for two or three days with the ex-director uh, of special ed here. So I'm uh, very hopeful that over a period of time, we can uh, do this, or we can conduct an excellent program at uh, the best possible cost. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the, uh, the buildings and whether we're physically able to absorb all of these students. It, can somebody uh, make sure that uh, a little bit of history is provided uh, to, the, to these consultants who are going to come in and consult with us about how to solve our space problems. Because we've had uh, far greater enrollments than the current enrollment or projected enrollment 
in the past. Right. And obviously, uh, uh, in that past, we have, and this is after the Cottage Farm School was closed, we have accommodated all of the students we had in town in the Pond Cove School, the middle school, and the high school. So I think we want to be real careful about having a consultant come in reinventing the wheel well, and telling us that we've got to spend a million dollars to build a new building or something when we've had far greater en enrollments in these three buildings. And, and, and a historical, really, to show it on a chart, you know, 1976, enrollment in the elementary was X, enrollment in the middle school was Y, etc., and then uh, where they fit. The demography for, I think, at least the last 10 years has been done on the computer at the New England School Development Council. Oh, all right. Now, number two, they know, they will know our enrollments and our class sizes. That'll go back historically quite a ways. And they'll know where they put them. In other words, in 1976, if we were confronted with an enrollment uh, greater than we're being confronted with now or in the immediate future, and we were able to find room for them in these three buildings, we ought to look at where we found room for them. Where, where, where did the students go? Well, and, and you know, they'll, they'll have all of the plans. They'll realize that the high school uh, with 150,000 square feet has held uh, a lot more people than it holds now. And it could in the future, you know. No, that's uh, the reason why I, I'm very pleased that NESDEC is doing this is they've done some pretty good work in a large number of communities with our same problem. You know, schools that have accommodated far larger numbers. Uh, they'll take a hard look at our organization as well <coughs> because that's important in terms of our buildings. And uh, hopefully we'll get a good report. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Priscilla? Number seven, uh, is this the same number of people that were in that room this year, in that area? No, minus one. Minus one, thank you. Okay. Right. Then I think we can move on to the next item, which is the discussion of the Soviet Sister City Committee. Madam Chairman, why don't I leave that to you? All right, thank you. This is a actually a whole packet I received in the mail, which you are all welcome to examine. Um, you have a copy of the letter suggesting that we form or we join with other organizations from this area trying to establish a sister city relationship with the city of Archangel in USSR. Um, it sounds to me like a positive thing to do, promoting world peace. I welcome your questions. No, I think all it wants is a letter from us. I think they got to go yeah. to the that's Soviets with want. a package, an envelope full of letters. Right, that's exactly Saying all those people want. for it. So uh, I would move it. When you write in the letter, you might suggest, that, well, why'd they pick Archangel? Why didn't they pick some Black Sea resort or something? <laughs> so <laughs> people visit. No, those people, they're going to go to visit Archangel. I mean, <laughs> No. That's heavy duty. <laughs> but give them the letter. Um, I say give them the letter. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. <laughs> right. Thank you. Oh, well, let's see. Our next <laughs> item is a report by Mrs. Stanford on the jump rope for heart activity. <laughs> Anine Stanford, elementary physical educator. Andy Stroud and myself during the week of March 23rd held jump rope marathons for the children in grades pre-kindergarten through grade four. The jump rope for heart marathons are done nationally each year and this is the fifth year they've been done. And they're sponsored by the American Heart Association and its local affiliates. And the American Association of Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance and its local affiliates of which Andy and I are both members. And there were two objectives of the jump rope marathons and the first was an opportunity for the children to experience extending themselves both mentally and physically beyond their already preconceived physical limits. In other words, they did far more than they really thought they were capable of doing. And also to relate that kind of exercise to cardiovascular fitness. And the second objective was to raise money to contribute towards heart research. 
Andy and I were extremely pleased with the children's performance and follow-up discussions with the kids following week found that they were very proud of themselves and very surprised that they were actually able to jump rope for an hour. We raised $5,100 when all the money was collected and sent that along to the main affiliate of the Heart Association. We contributed all of our money towards the research rather than have that be used for gifts to send the children as incentives for doing this jump rope for heart. And on behalf of the main affiliate and Andy, I would like to express appreciation to the community of Cape Elizabeth for your overwhelming generosity. Thank you for spending your time and effort on such a worthwhile project. I know the kids loved it. <laughs> Let's see, next we have discussion of teacher openings for the next school year. We are presently, uh, Madam Chairman, interviewing for uh, the following. I might add that uh, we're overwhelmed with the number of uh, applications we have received to date. I think uh, the Secretary said it was well over 250 applications. It's, it's interesting when uh, Commissioner Weitler indicated that there are 500 openings that aren't going to be filled in this state. So uh, we're attracting an awful lot of people. The list uh, at the present time is the athletic director. Uh, we've narrowed that down to a number of finalists, physical education, reading and writing lab, teacher assistant, one half social studies, which will probably be difficult because of the half time, library A, teacher assistant, career ladder. We have a sixth grade, an eighth grade English, a half French, and a teacher assistant in the career ladder in the middle school. Uh, we have a first grade opening at the present time, a teacher assistant in the behavioral resource room, and an occupational therapist that we'll wait and let uh, our new director find. I would like to uh, read this uh, resignation, Madam Chairman, that I received only a few minutes ago. I would very much like to regret to inform you and the school board that I'm resigning my position as an eighth grade teacher at the middle school, effective as of the 1987-88 school year. I've been offered and accepted the position of principal of the junior high in Old Orchard Beach. The three years I've spent in Cape Elizabeth have been three of the most exciting and educationally stimulating years of my life, and I'd like someday to return to this school district. I've enjoyed working with teachers, administrators, and school board members and believe that Cape Elizabeth is the most challenging and forward-looking district in our state. It's been my privilege to work here. However, I do feel that I've reached a point in my life where I'm ready to move on into a different and perhaps more challenging aspect of education and look forward to my new role as an administrator. Sincerely, Joyce Barker. We'll miss her. I think the old orchard's after us sometimes. So we, will, <laughs> we, we should fun. compliment her, and I, I would hope we that we formally accept her as a With regret, I think. Right. Yes. Um, our next item is the announcement of funded grants for 8788. But I'm very pleased to inform you that two of our grants have been accepted by the Department of Education <clears throat> And cultural services. The first one, Thinking for Teaching, is a staff development program and is funded to the tune of 2000. The second one, the Teacher Techniques and Mathematics, has also been funded to the tune of approximately 5,000. I'm extremely pleased that we will receive these funds and compliment Mary Jo Thompson and Barbara Powers for designing and writing these grants. I think we're fortunate to have grants in two areas that, that we've pinpointed as, as wanting to spend some time on, and um, I'm very grateful to both of those. I would just bring to your attention uh, the, uh, the comments on the review panel on the uh, $2,000 grant. That's great. I was just very pleased to hear that uh, they felt as strongly about our I, I guess I'd like to read a couple of them mm -hmm. so people right. can hear. They said, this is an excellent proposal. The need statement is particularly strong. Uh, make sure the connection to the gifted and talented program is understood. Huge impact on increased teacher effectiveness. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of very positive comments here. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, 
And we're going to move on to the regular agenda now, starting with the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting, which we held on May 12, 1987. Were there any additions or corrections from the board? Um, if there aren't, then we can approve the minutes as written. Um, the next item, the approval of the minutes of the special meeting held on May 27, 1987. Additions or corrections? Then we'll approve the minutes as written. <clears throat> um, our third item is the business manager's report. Nancy Keniston. Okay, we'll start with the financial statement, which um, basically indicates that we're going to receive everything that everyone promised us, in addition to uh, about uh, $30,000 that we were not anticipating interest on our bond indebtedness, which will help us year-end. Uh, any questions, I'll go on to the... Explain that again. That's, uh, as I mentioned before, we're receiving um, $30,000 as an interest payment on the bonds for the high school. Thank we were not anticipating that. And I might mention too that each year for the next, uh, through 1992, we will receive some sum. Of course, it depends on the interest rates and so forth. So it's kind of hard for the bank right now to project. So it's therefore hard for us to budget the money, but it will be some amount each year that we'll have to add to our revenues. Under the expenditure side, um, we're about 91% of the year complete as of May 30th, 31st, and our total expenditures are at 87%. I'm anticipating that we will have um, somewhere in the vicinity of a $100,000 balance forward as we projected and budgeted as revenue next year. Um, we, it may be a little more than that, because uh, we've ha had further savings in our fuel oil accounts, so that will be helpful. Okay, um, the food service program. Again, um, the food service folks, Sherry Small is the director, and the cafeteria managers and workers have done an excellent job for another year. We will, um, in all likelihood, probably earn a profit of about $1,000 this year, uh, which is, you know, very good. Uh, last year, uh, this year <clears throat> we, it was an exceptional year. It was excessive uh, uh, illness, no, no one's fault, but we had a couple of people who had extended illnesses, which really ate into what would have otherwise been a higher profit. And so next year I'm anticipating that um, <clears throat> even with various increases in salary, fringe benefits, costs of food, and so forth, we still will be back up uh, to uh, where we were in 1985-86 as far as profit goes. But I think Sherry Small just has to be commended for running such a successful food service program. And I think of a few years yeah. ago that we were worried about underwriting the right. school lunch program. Those, those folks, all of those folks in that program are extremely dedicated to the program yeah. and have worked very hard to, uh, to bring that program around. Yeah. I met with them last week and they really are very excited about the program and they have some suggestions that we're considering for another year. And I, I think it'll just get better. With community services, um, we're projecting at this point um, around a $4,000 surplus over and above what we're projecting for revenue for the school department's use. Um, and we'll put that into their uh, contingency <coughs> fund for next year's use. So unless there are any questions, Thank you, Nancy. Welcome. Um, number four on our regular agenda is the report on the elementary school playground. And Dr. Pelletier, I'll look to you. The, uh, needless to say, the reports on the from the playground committee have been voluminous. And I, as a superintendent, have never read as 
much material on treated wood as I have in the numerous reports that have come to me. After reading all of the arsenic, copper, and chrome, and redwood, and how long it lasts, uh, it's very difficult to make a decision. But after talking with a number of people, I'm going to recommend to the board that the study finish, that we complete phase two, and we use the pressure treated wood, which is the very same uh, kind of wood that we presently have. Uh, we have checked into redwood and a host of others, and they probably bring different kinds of problems. However, the incidence of this is extremely few, and everywhere I look, and people I interview, particularly the athletic people, indicate that they're using preserved wood in a host of areas. So I'd suggest that we stop reading all these technical scientific reports and move forward with the committee phase two of the playground so that we would be, we would have completed this task in a year and a half. So move. <laughs> Second. Um, oh, well, any discussion from the board? Uh, Don't get upset that we're moving along. I, I won't. All right. All in favor. I'm just uncomfortable if people came here wanting oh. to comment on this from Good the public. Point. Good there, Harold, Good that's all. And I agree with you. I'll make a comment. Uh, we had discussed this no, previously. No, <laughs> Yeah, that's right, Jay. <laughs> well, I still have I still have about two two minute comment. We I remember reading all this material. I think in the fall, um, I reread it, and I really find in any of these kinds of things to give somebody a five thousand unit dosage over a one fifth time and find out that they get some remote problem supposedly caused by any agent seems so such an overemphasis on safety that it becomes really insanity. I, I think that there's so such a remote possibility of any student being harmed in any way by pressure treated lumber that I totally agree with what you say that we should move ahead and not become so uh, suit conscious and so legally entangled with the most remote possibility of some minor injury or um, infection from a splinter with treated wood that um, it, you know, we would be paralyzed if we really treated everything the way this subject has been, been dealt with. So I think that we're ready to move on and consider it done. I, I just really need to check before we vote if anybody here is very upset that we're voting on this right now and is just absolutely dying to contribute something to the conversation. All right, then we're ready to vote. All in favor. Four to nothing. Thank you. Well, for all your hard work, Sue, so that was great. Um, we now have consideration of a report by the superintendent regarding class size. This is the second reading of a new policy we've been trying to establish to to basically put some parameters and guidelines on class size. We all know that there's, there are always things that come up every year that maybe don't fit a hard and fast rule, but we as a board have never even tried to establish a policy, and that's what we're doing now. Daryl. I would like to reiterate that uh, a policy on class size is a guideline. And uh, when we're as, as tight as we are in terms of space, we certainly have to consider these guidelines. Uh, the enrollment for next September is in front of you in the Bond Hill School. And you will know that uh, it falls within the guidelines at this date. However, uh, in the event that we exceed these recommended sizes by one or two, it does not mean that we would start another class or hire another teacher because first we wouldn't have any place to put them. But these are guidelines that we think uh, represent good 
teacher-pupil ratios at various areas of the school organization. And uh, I present them as the second reading as a policy, but I wanted to reiterate, as a policy guideline. I think it might be helpful if I just read down what the recommendation is so those of you who are here can hear what we have in front of us. Sometimes it's frustrating when we talk on and on about these papers nobody can see. Um, in the pre-K, we have a minimum size of 10 and a maximum of 15 and a recommended size of 12. Kindergarten, what did I say? I'm sorry, excuse me, 13. Um, kindergarten, minimum size of 10, maximum size of 20, recommended size 18. Grade one, minimum size 15, maximum size 21, recommended size 20. Grades two and three, minimum size 15, maximum size 24, recommended size 20. Grades four and five, minimum size 15, maximum size 25, recommended size 22. Six through eight, minimum size 15, maximum size 25, recommended size 22. Um, grades nine through 12, minimum size 10, maximum size 30, recommended size is 22. And then in the practical arts like industrial technology and home economics, the minimum size is 12, the maximum size is 20, and the recommended size is 18. Now comments from the board, any questions? I guess I've had a problem recently with the policy in that I feel the board and the administrators zero in on maximum size instead of the focus being on recommended size. Uh, and that really bothers me when you speak about, well, we'll be okay. I'm just going to take an example and I could be using the wrong grade, so please. Uh, second grade, we're running uh, 20, well, I was looking for the size, we're running 24.7 children over, rather than zeroing in on where the recommended size would be down at 22. So we say, okay, we'll go along with that maximum size, even though it's 0.7 children over, but then you're going to end up at a far greater class size than if you were looking at your recommended size and then going to decision-making on other teachers. Um, maybe I'm looking at, at the wrong line here. I I'm recommended using, size for second grade 20, and we have, for example, 19 coming in. Is that? I, I, I look you just here, read the long line, that's all, but okay. still well Yeah, well, that's right, that we shouldn't focus on the on the maximum that's size and figure that up, the, we can go up to that limit. But I, th I see the, min the recommended size and the maximum size more as an evening of the distribution of children in each grade, rather than have one class at the <laughs> maximum size and have some classes below the recommended si size. Suppo I mean, assumedly, we would have all the classes approximately the same number if there's one more or one less. But I, I, don't, I think that we would be aiming, and I would expect us to aim at the recommended size, but in some years or at some times, for reasons of space, for reasons of uh, for many reasons, actually, primarily space and budget, that we may have to approach the maximum size rather than stay at the recommended size or but, under the recommended size. But my point was that what I've heard in discussion in the last two months through budget and through mm -hmm. our reports on what class sizes are going to be, our updates continually, the focus has seemed to have been on the maximum, where we are as far as the maximum, not where we are as far mm -hmm. as recommended, and that's a real difference. I, I, I uh, think Priscilla makes some sense here, uh, as usual. The, what, we, what we have here is recommended class sizes. That's the third column, right? We have three columns. Minimum size, maximum size, and recommended size. So if you have a recommended size, that's what you want to have. 
We're saying that's what we ought to have, is the number in the, in the classroom that is under the title recommended size. So that's it, why don't you just have one column? Recommended size. Now, if you go over, whatever, you're still gonna to come to the board or you're still gonna look at it as a, on a case-by-case -case basis and decide whether it's a problem or not. My, my view is that anything over the, that, that, that anything over the recommended size is a problem. And it's one that you deal with. But the way it's listed now, it says recommended size 20, maximum size 24, means to me that the, the, the 20 means nothing, as long as you don't exceed the max. So I'd rather have just a column saying, is the recommended size, here's, the policy of the school board is to have class sizes as follows. Now, nothing is inflexible. No one's gonna go to jail if we have one or two more after the board discusses it in a classroom. But the purpose here is to have a policy, and our policy is, here's the recommendations for each of these classes. We're going to have enough flexibility to make adjustments on a case-by-case -case basis. The superintendent can certainly live with that. As a matter of fact, uh, the important column for the consultants is the recommended size. That's right. That's the first thing they're going to ask. Yeah. I, I think that's a good suggestion. I have all along had a real concern with our stating a minimum size, except uh, as it relates through grades 9 through 12. I, I think it's appropriate to have a minimum size there because uh, quite probably there are many situations where there might be three or four students wanting to take a course, and perhaps we just can't afford to offer a course for three, four, five, six students. So at the high school, 9 through 12, I think it's appropriate to have um, a minimum size. But in, in grades K through 8, I really have a concern with a minimum size that that will, in the future, be interpreted in a different way than it was here intended. And that is to say that we will start to draw off portions of students and have portions in a class of 10 for some perceived necessary reason and then have other kids in the recommended size, that is to say a class of 22. I think particularly um, in, when I hear some talk about how uh, gifted and talented students just absolutely can't um, have their needs met in the classroom with ordinary not gifted and talented students. I really would worry that this minimum size would lead any, somebody to believe that we have here the opportunity to offer a class for 10 students or for 12 students under the recommended minimum size for some, as I said before, perceived necessary reason. I, so I, I really feel a concern with the minimum size here, except as it relates to high school. I, th I don't think we should focus on the maximum size. I had understood the maximum size was being put down in you know actual uh, numerical counts, so that those in those indication, in those particular circumstances, the school board wouldn't need to be consulted. That we understand that in the uh, third grade, for example, that if there would be more than 24 students in a classroom, that would not be educationally acceptable in this community. And so, therefore, without discussion, the superintendent would understand that in that case, a teacher needed to be hired. But in that sort of flex area between 20 and 24, perhaps some discussion is worthwhile. So f I think for that reason, there is an advantage to have the maximum size. I can also understand what you say, that we should be shooting for the recommended size, and if there's a, a, some flex one way or the other, um, then it's worth discussing at that point. But I, the bottom line for me is that the minimum size uh, I think could be interpreted later to be something other than what it was intended to be here. So where are we right now with this? <laughs> Ready for a vote. Oh, we got to ask the audience. Yes, all right. All right. Is there anyone from the audience? Thank you. I'm Deborah Jordan, and as a classroom teacher, um, I commend you on looking at the maximum and being concerned about class size. 
I think all of us who are teachers recognize that that's probably the number one issue in assuring a real quality program. However, as a pre-K uh, teacher here, I'm concerned with the policy of setting a minimum of 10 for the pre-K program. And my concern is that throughout the summer, uh, historically, we have always added numbers to our program. And the other piece is that in the fall, after children start school, there is often a need for children to be moved from a kindergarten program back into a pre-K program. If we set a minimum of 10 prior to that August screening and even prior to some time in September, then we can, can there might be a possibility of uh, not allowing some of those children to move into a pre-K program if that be necessary. So I would just want to state that I would encourage you not to set that as a policy of 10 at this time of the year, but to allow us the flexibility for some movement into the fall. Thank you, Deborah. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? Gail Hahn, I have a question about what you would do if you had, say, eight students for pre-K and you wanted ten. What would happen to these eight? Would you farm them out into a kindergarten class or? I don't think we can answer that question. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I think this, that uh, the pre-K is going to be evaluated as an institution along the line here in any event. So you're, if you're asking for a commitment from the board that, uh, you know, whether we eliminate pre-K mm -hmm. uh, under those circumstances or any other circumstances, I, 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 I just don't think we know the answer. Okay. You see, that's why I reiterate, a policy of this sort has to be a guideline. Yeah. If you had a third class that could not be scheduled in any other way, and you had eight in advanced calculus, you see, the superintendent would have to deal with that. And he would probably deal with that by hiring a teacher or coming to the board and saying, we have eight whose schedules cannot be changed. Right. That's why any kind of policy, whether it be preschool or senior, has to be a guideline where you use a certain amount of sense. And that, isn't that what we're saying here, even if, even if we just use the recommended one, and the middle, which it was, it's still just policy and it's a guideline. guideline. Right. guideline. And if there are nine, then we'll deal with the problem when there are nine, or 12, That's right. or 13. We assume we'll discuss that at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. so Harold, would you feel, in terms of talking about if we were to just leave the recommended size, how do you feel about setting a minimum size for high school classes? Because that comes up frequently. That's not something that I'm sure this board or the superintendent would really want to come to us each and every time we have six students who want to take a course at the high school. I mean, that to me is a frequent occurrence. Or may, perhaps it isn't. Maybe we should ask Michael. Well, is I, that I don't know that eight is a frequent occurrence. It's 25 to 50 years. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear it. Yeah, I mean, we, I make those decisions all the time, mm -hmm. uh, standardly. When a class looks like it's only going to have six students in the, in the pre-sign-up, we take it off the master schedule at that point. Mm -hmm. I use the guideline of a minimum of 10 now, and when classes fall below that, unless they're special kind of classes, like uh, um, a level three class, that that's part of a continuum of offering uh, ability-wise or, or, or a continuity of program like, uh, like, like French 5. Um, outside, outside of that stuff, I mean, I've, we make that choice all the time, constantly. I mean, and I don't go and tell you every class that it, that's been eliminated, but pretty much all classes that aren't projected to be a 10 get eliminated at that uh, after the first course selection sheets are handed in? Uh, I, uh, I, I think more often than not we hear about it, Michael. First of all, we get telephone calls from people whose sons or daughters were planning on taking the course. So, and they say, how come they're canceling such and such a course? So all we're talking about here yeah. is a 
the guideline. This is the policy. This is what we want you to shoot for. How can we have problems? Uh, exercise good judgment and come to us and say, look, you know, we're going to be over or way low on something and we want you to know about it. And that's what you do anyway. I don't see any problem with this. Daryl, are the recommended sizes from research? Is that where you got them? Uh, we well, looked at several 20, policies. 20. We looked at several, you know, school districts that appear to be similar to ours. And the research, quite honestly, just with class size, you can almost find anything you want. Well, if it's below 10, it's great. And if it's over 50, it's bad. I know that. <laughs> Beyond that, I don't think that there is any conclusive evidence. I, I would have to just say shades of Howard Dana. I know that. <laughs> He ha has always, when Howard Dana was on the school board, he repeatedly challenged anybody, school teachers, administrators, uh, members of the public, parents, anybody and everybody, to come up with the first piece of data that said class size has anything to do with achievement. And interestingly enough, uh, eight or ten years ago until now, nobody has. What about, what about you, know, that, you mean nobody's done one of those studies at the Harvard? Well, nobody has come forward what? with any done the of studies, data that they didn't What about them. common sense? Obviously, we all feel that it does, but what I'm saying is that I, you know, humorously remember oh, yeah. lots of... Well, so lots I have of to tell Howard about made. that other study called common sense. <laughs> <laughs> I always watch it. Barbara. Um, Barbara Powers, third grade teacher. Um, I just for the record, wanted to say something because I'm very excited about this discussion. First of all, a quick digression. Regarding studies, there are some out there, and frankly, I'd hope to have time before tonight to get out to the university and research that for you because I know from my university studies that that, that framework of 14 to 21 for top achievement is, stands out in my mind as being a validated statistic. So I'm very encouraged with your look at recommended sizes. And secondly, Harold. I wanted it to be on record. Um, something you said two or three months ago at a board meeting has sort of stuck with me, and that is that you often hear us as teachers come before you with proposals for special education and gifted and talented and who's advocating for that child in the middle, and I would propose to you tonight that this is the strongest statement we can make. Recommended class sizes is for, is for all children and benefits all children far more than just about anything we can come before you with. So um, your support of the recommended sizes is really heartening. I agree that it's, it's helpful to have some maximum sizes so that as a school we can look to enrollment increases over the summer and get a feel for when something needs to be brought for you because frankly two weeks from this night as we speak there could be a major change in numbers. But if you feel that on a case-by-case -case basis we could look at it really shooting for recommended sizes, I think that would be outstanding. Thank you very much for the comments, Mrs. Powell. It's also consistent on my pack, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because when we got into the discussion about leveling, uh, I was told that you can deal with these de minimis differences in students' abilities I use the word de minimis, de minimis to get a little sarcastic, but you can deal with differences in a single classroom, one classroom, uh, differences with the students' abilities, the smaller the group. The smaller the group, the easier it is for the teacher to deal with. And I'm very aware of that statement, and, and I agree with it. So as we shrink these class sizes and give more and more attention in a single classroom to all of the students, in that classroom, a smaller group of students, then uh, there will be less necessity to toss some of the students out of the classroom and say you can't sit here with these other kids. That's right. Thank you. Daryl, would it hamper you to have us remove the minimum and maximum sizes? Do you feel, why did you recommend this policy as it is? Again, it's merely a guideline. Uh -huh. We budget. And as you notice, the high school principal, uh, we use 10 as, you know, a figure. It's an understanding. It's an understanding. understanding. And it makes pretty good sense. And then if we want to have an exception, we can come and say, this, the reason for the exception is following. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason. And you'll note, in most of the uh, school systems I've examined, you'll find a minimum size. And that's for budgetary purposes. That's a good guideline to budget 
personnel, I think. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can do without it because I have. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be worthwhile to consider adopting a policy with minimum, maximum, and recommended, and have a suggestion or part of the policy be that the understanding is clearly that the recommended sizes would be that which we focus on, not the maximum number. That may be one way to get around what you see, what you observed happening, Priscilla. How, how would you feel about that? Or you still don't I feel, feel that that was the purpose of the policy, and as I say, okay. during budget time, and the last month since budget, mm -hmm. that's all I've heard is mm -hmm. maximum size. We're reaching, you know, we're over, we're 0.7 over maximum size in a certain grade level, mm -hmm. this type of thing. And that is the focus then on maximum. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I agree with uh, Michelle. I'd like us to make a clear statement, not with these ranges, a clear statement of what we think the class sizes should be. And if they have to, if, if, if they can make a case for having a larger class size in a particular case or cases, make the case for it. And I'm sure that, you know, we, we, we listen to the superintendent all the time. Mm -hmm. But I, want, I, don't want to, I don't want to be fuzzy. I want to say, here's what we think the class size should be. And don't get distracted by all these maximums and minimums. Mm -hmm. Focus on what the board thinks class size should be. Madam Chairman, I would suggest to the board that we look at the first paragraph and the fourth line that says, therefore, the recommended class size in the Cape Elizabeth schools will be, shall be, should be, and list the recommended class size right in the leading paragraph. That would establish what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then we would write a minimum class size policy and a maximum as a guide for budgetary purposes or for individual problems analyzed by the administration. In that way, you would be stating your philosophy and we'd be establishing a couple guidelines that would help us in budget. That would be a third revision and I would bring it back to you in September. I think it would be nice to see it all written down the way it's going to be before we vote on it. Is that acceptable? It's, you know, I can't say this, Mason. The problem is that we lose these things. You know, we have an idea, you sit up here and, and you have an idea of what you want to do, and then uh, we say, well, let's get another piece of paper and redesign it, and, and we lose it. I mean, so and I know what we want to do here. Superintendent knows what he wants to do. Uh, we'd, like, we'd still like to do what we want to do, and if we lose, we lose. He's a smart guy, this fellow over here. He knows this. What's I don't see the harm of having a match. Uh, yeah, you can make a motion. I would like to move that we accept a class size policy with just the recommended size within the policy. Second. All right. Any more discussion? Um, all right. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> I have Sharon's hand up. <laughs> Opposed? I'm not going to vote because I'm not ready to vote on it. So we've carries. got the motion carries two to one. Is that what it is? Motion All right. Two to one. There you go. We don't have to say it again. You'll know what you got to do. I don't have a clear picture. All right. Uh, number six is consideration of a report by the superintendent regarding foreign language in the elementary school. Madam Chairman, the Foreign Language Committee decided in February that it would not make a decision on what we would do as of September. They proposed that they continue their study through the fall of 87 
They've requested a budget, and we've provided for that in our budget for traveling and some consultants that's coming to talk to the group. They have a variety of professional materials that are available at our public library on reserve for the committee members and other interested parties. I'm also pleased to see they have eight townspeople that have joined them. And uh, I have read all of their minutes and have talked with their chairman, and I'm very pleased with the direction they're taking. And I suspect that very early in the year, like January, we will get their recommendations. That'll be prior to budget time, and we can give some thought to hopefully some kind of implementation the following year, and we'll be able to budget that. I think we have one board member on that committee. Say, you can probably add something to that. Just really a short message to the board from the committee members. Uh, there were several several of people sitting on the committee, primarily the teachers on the committee, who felt very strongly that they have served on committee after committee after committee, and a given committee made up, as we have all spoken about before, of the natural constituency of for any given topic comes up with a grandiose plan to implement implement whatever it is they have in mind foreign languages in the elementary school and to start a program will only cost one hundred and forty thousand dollars and lo and behold they bring it to the budget and the school board then says oh my goodness we can't afford this um, I think that we'll begin with allocating 8,000 or 10,000 or 5,000 or nothing. This is not one of our priorities, for example. So the message from the committee is, it, would it be possible for the board to give some indication of the strength of the support for establishing a foreign language <coughs> program in the elementary school? I was clear to point out that there was no way, there is no way that this board can give any kind of a budget guarantee whatsoever out of the budget process. And the committee clearly understood that. But really what they're hoping for is to have some indication that that this is becoming or has become become one of the priorities of this board is to begin a foreign language in the elementary program in our next budget session. That is to say for the year September 1988, is that right? Mm -hmm. 89. So is there an indication that more than one, two, three members of this board would really like to do that and could foresee allocating some budget money for that? Well, well first of all, I appreciate being asked. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, what usually happens is that they bring it to you at the end, and then when you say, no, you can't have the 120, they say, how can you tell 26 people who spent week after week working on something that the, pro that the program can't be instituted? That's wrong. So I, I think this is nice to at least get some input philosophically how we feel. Mm -hmm. Philosophically, I agree with foreign languages in the elementary school. Strongly agree. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know anything about the money. I know nothing about the details. I know nothing about what you want to teach them. I'm just telling you the answer to your question. Philosophically, I favor it. Mm -hmm. They can't tell you what we're going to vote for. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the trouble. I favor it also. I, I favored the computer proposal very strongly, and um, we ended up with not too much of that. So the, the problem mm -hmm. is money on budget. I like the idea and the philosophy of starting mm -hmm. foreign language in the elementary school. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, exactly how I feel. I, the computer, it's, it's we were all excited time. about, and when we got down to the bottom mm -hmm. line in our budget, and now the window was planned, and it was, a, and it still is an excellent proposal. So, yes, lost mm -hmm. philosophically, yes. Mm -hmm. but, I, th I think what the committee, uh, uh, one of the things that may be considered is, for example, computers, I mean, this, this is directed toward one portion of our school system. This is not whether we want to offer foreign languages in the Cape Elizabeth school system. This is really directed toward what we want to consider our elementary grades, K through 5, K through 6, K through 4, whatever we want to consider that portion of our grades, which are elementary, no matter where they're housed. So, assumedly, there is some 
educational merit to not to um, condensing a computer instruction, for example, and some benefit to delaying the introduction of computers to students in terms of priorities. The, a case could be made for that. But in this instance, a case I think more strongly could be made for not delaying the introduction of foreign language. So if you're not going to delay it into the middle school, assumedly then it's important to begin it in the elementary school. Um, I could foresee, uh, j really, I I'm not speaking as a voice for the committee's decisions because we have not made decisions at all. But I could foresee a proposal coming forward which would entail the hiring of one full-time teacher, for example. So what, what would the cost, what would you imagine the cost of that would be in total? 25,000. 25,000. materials. I mean, I'm not asking for a guarantee, and the committee certainly understands that this is not a commitment of funds, because it's just out of the, out of the way that things have to be done. But if when the number comes forward, $25,000, is that something that makes everybody horrified at the thought of spending $25,000 to institute a new program? What kind of feeling do you have about that? Uh, now you're getting closer. You know, <laughs> I, I, I understand, and the committee understands this is not a guarantee, a commitment mm -hmm. in any way. I'm just saying, what's your feeling about it? Why do you need to know? If it's not a commitment, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. What do you need to know? I, because I think the committee is feeling exactly as you said, that it's unfair to ask a committee of 20, 25 people to put a lot of time into gathering a proposal and coming forward with a proposal that needs some funding that people, when an initial number, let's say, to just begin to toss around an initial number of 20, $25,000, that it's something that is far out of the realm of what people have in mind. Well, it wouldn't surprise me that it would cost $25,000 to have a teacher come and teach a mm -hmm. foreign language in elementary mm -hmm. school. So the message to the committee is that it sounds like a good idea, it sounds like a good program, $25,000, is an, a, a number that was mentioned, but is not a number that's being considered. Why don't you tell them we figure that if, we, if, we're for, if we're for foreign language in the elementary school, we figure somebody's got to teach it. And okay. we figure whoever teaches has got to get paid. And that that person is not now in the elementary school. There is no mm -hmm. foreign language teacher there. So therefore, we're not paying a foreign language teacher presently in the elementary school. And we recognize that. They're going to have to hire somebody to teach it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I will.